This lesson is control the visibility and lifetime of data. The objectives for this lesson are to learn about the scope of variables, see demos of block, method, and class level scope, learn how to use static methods and classes. When we talk about the scope of a variable, we're talking about we're controlling from where a C sharp member can be accessed. And they can be accessed at the class level, the method level, block level, and assembly level. And we're going to take a look at all of these in this lesson. Now, members can be classes and interfaces, variables, properties, fields, constants, methods, events, and constructors. There are basically four different scope types, also called access modifiers. There's public, which means that member can be seen from anywhere. Private means only within the class where they are defined. Protected means they can be seen in the same class they're defined or inherited classes. Internal means within the assembly in which they are defined. That's the only location they can be seen. Now, variables can have a block level scope. So if you declare a variable within a block, and a block is something like an if, a do, a while, a for, things like that, those types of constructs are blocks. If you declare that variable within that block, the variable only can be seen within that block, and the variable's lifetime is only until that block ends. Let's take a look at using block level scope of variables. If you open up program.cs and you write this code for int index equals 1, index less than or equal to 10, index plus plus, inside of that for loop, you can use index. But index is defined within that for block. So that means on line 5, you can see the red squiggly there. Index is not available because it's only available within that for. Now, one thing you could do is you could actually cut this out, place it up here so it's outside of the four, and now look, line seven will now work. Because it was declared outside of the four block, you can now use it. Let's now change this again. Let's put back the int index equals one. So index is still only available within the four block, but look what I'm doing now. Inside of an if inside of the four, that's another block. So string name equals loop plus index. Name is now only available within that if block. So between lines three and six is the only place where name can be used. If we uncomment this, you can see the compiler complains at us. So each time through the loop, a new name variable is being created. Notice also though that index is being used within that if. That's perfectly fine because within a nested block like we have here, you can use any variable declared in the outer block. Let's now take a look at declaring variables within a method. When it's in a method, it's called method level scope. So you declare that variable within a method. The scope now is within that method and the variable's lifetime is until the method ends. Let's see an example of the method level scope of variables. In the product class, I've added a new method called method level block sample. And inside of here, I've declared two variables, decimal price and decimal cost. And then I'm using the underscore profit variable from outside this method, but because the outside of this method is a class, the product class, it's lower level, so it's a nested block. The class is a block, the method is a block. Decimal price and decimal cost can only be used within this method, but profit, since it comes from a higher level, can be seen and used inside of here. If I were to try to come down here and use a price or a cost, it isn't available because it's outside of the method level block sample. And let's take a look finally at the class level scope of variables. When we talk about class level scope, we're talking about private variables declared within a class. So in this one, I have public class product open curly brace. 
and then a closing curly brace all the way down there on line 105. Now, any private variable declared within a class has class level scope. It's only allowed to be seen within this class. So that includes things like the default underscore color constant, the underscore standard cost, the underscore list price, the underscore profit. These are the things that have class level scope. And if we go over to program and we try to declare entity here as a new product and we do entity dot, we can't get at any of the list price, the standard cost. We can't get at that, ver uh, that constant. See, so the only thing you're allowed to get at are those public entities. Another access modifier that we'll use quite a bit is called protected. Let's take a look at protected scope of variables. To illustrate protected, change the private decimal underscore profit to protected. Now, protected means that it can be seen anywhere within product, so we can still access it everywhere. So you can see down here, it's still available. The compiler is not complaining at us. Let's now add a class, and we'll call it bicycle. And inside of here, we'll do a public class bicycle that inherits from product. And maybe we add a new property called handlebar style. But look inside of this public void check variables. We can access profit from here because it is protected. See, no problem. IntelliSense comes right up. But we still can't do the default color. We still can't do underscore standard cost. We can access standard cost and we can access list price or any other public property because that's allowed. But the only thing you can access down here that's kind of more of a protected nature are anything marked as protected. And you still wouldn't be able to see it out here in program either. So underscore profit is still not available to us because it's not marked as public. Not only can you change the scope of variables and properties, you can also change the scope of methods. Let's take a look. If you remember, we have the private void calculate profit. We can change that to be protected. Once you mark that, everything still works the same as in the product class did before, but now we can go to the bicycle and anywhere, we can now call that too, calculate profit. See, it now shows up. Isn't that nice? So protected variables, protected properties, protected methods are all things you're going to be using quite a bit in your object-oriented programming. I'm now going to take a look at the internal access modifier by showing you how to apply an internal to the scope of classes. Let's go to the solution and let's add a new project and we're going to add a class library. Now, when you're adding a class library here, you want to actually target the one that says a project for creating a class library that targets .NET or .NET standard. Click Next. I'm going to call it common.library, and I'm going to click Next. I'm going to choose the same framework that I chose before when we created the C-sharp samples. And then I'm going to rename this to be clothing. And we'll have it rename that. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and put this in the namespace common library. Now if you'll notice here, product is giving me an error. Why? Because it says it can't find it. Are you missing a using directive or an assembly reference? Whenever you add a library, you need to add a project reference to where that product exists. I'm going to click OK. And now this thing can actually fix it for us. So we'll just click on this and it adds that using statement for us. Isn't that nice? Now, if you look at everything, everything works just like it did before. So even though we are in two different assemblies, we have a common.library assembly, we have a C -sharp samples assembly. Clothing is in the one assembly, product is in the other we can still use everything just like we did before. It all works. Here's the thing. If I go over to the product class and I change this from public to internal, now what happens is 
product is only available within the assembly in which it's defined. That's the C sharp samples. If I now come over here, now it gives me all these errors saying, well, can't find product because it's inaccessible due to its protection level. Protection level meaning like the axis modifier. So then obviously it can't get at underscore profit, it can't get at calculate profit, can't get at the list price or the standard cost because product is basically not usable. Let's change that back so we can still run, but that's a great example there of how internal works. As a general rule, you want to try to keep the scope of any member as small as possible. That keeps our data isolated and less chance for something else to modify it and possibly change the data that we weren't expecting to have happen. Now, I'm not saying you're going to put everything within blocks and, you know, declare all the variables within blocks and all of that. I don't do that very often. I keep things usually at a class level or a method level. That's me personally. Again, that's kind of a style thing that's up to you. Another modifier you might use is the static modifier. And we add static to classes, to methods, or properties. Now, only a single instance of the class or the property then is created for the entire running application. That means that we access that method or property through the class name. You can't access through an instance of the class. Let's take a look at using static methods. In the product class, locate the public decimal calculate profit by ref. And let's now add on the keyword static. By adding this keyword, it's still public, but it means that we can no longer access this through an instance of product. We go over here to program. Now look at what we've done. I've eliminated any declaration of a new product. Instead, on line six, I'm simply doing product dot calculate profit by ref. By adding this static modifier, it says this is one method that method doesn't use any of the properties that are contained within the product class. I'm going to pass stuff in. I'm going to get stuff out. That's when you're going to be writing static methods is if you just want to pass something in, get something out, and it really doesn't rely on any data within that class at all. Let's now create a class that is static and only has static methods within it. Right mouse click on the C Sharp Samples project and let's add a new class and this one will be called Phone Helper. And what I've done here on line six is I've created a public static class, Phone Helper. When you create a static class, it means that all methods and properties within that class must be static. So on line 12, I have a public static string, create US phone number with dashes. I'm going to pass in a phone number. It's going to strip out any other formatting characters and return that North American phone number with the dash format. I also have another method that says create US phone number with parens. It's also a static method to which I'm going to pass a phone. It'll strip out all the formatting and return a phone in the kind of US format. So how do I use this then, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you on the program.cs. I've created a phone parens. I've created a phone dashes. I've created a phone with nothing in it. And then all we're going to do is we're going to do some console.write lines. And I've got one that says phone helper dot create US phone number with dashes. I'm going to pass in the one with the parens. And then I'm doing phone helper dot create US phone number with parens, passing in the one with the dashes. So it's just going to flip flop them around, right? And then I'm going to call the same ones using the phone number without any formatting characters at all. So, but this gives you an example of how you would use a static class with just static methods. You pass data in, does some work, and then passes the data right back out. So we run this and we get what we're thinking we should get. The partial modifier is a keyword that you add to a class if you want to define a class within multiple files. What happens then is the compiler will bring all those class definitions together. Now this isn't really so much a scoping thing, but it kind of fit here. So let's 
see an example of using partial classes. Right mouse click on the common.library project and add a new folder and we'll call it entity classes. Then right mouse click on that folder, add a class also called clothing. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to add a size property over here. Now we're still getting that non-nullable size, right? If you remember what we do there is we right mouse click on the project, go to properties, go to build, and we disable that nullable flag. Now when we come back here, everything's fine. But notice what I've done on this declaration of clothing. Public partial class. By adding that partial keyword, it's saying I'm expecting clothing to be fine somewhere else in some other file. It should also have partial on it as well, so we're going to add it to the clothing one that we did before. What happens then is at compile time, the compiler takes these two classes, puts them together, right? And so now we've got everything. And if you notice here, I'm in the, let's go back over to this one. So if I, you know, were to access something over here, let's say I created a private void test method. So in clothing, if you remember, I actually had, what did I have over here? Um, didn't have a property. Let's add a property, int clothing size. Okay, so maybe we've got sizes like 32, 34, things like that. If I come over here to this one, I can say clothing size, and I get the property. That's great. If I come over to the other one, and I try to access size, I get that one. So everything is just put together, which means I can access anything from anywhere else. As long as it's marked partial, the compiler takes care of bringing these two together so it doesn't look like anything different from the compiler's standpoint. In this lesson, you learned about the scope of variables. We saw the differences between public, private, protected, and internal. We learned about static methods and classes, and we even used a partial class. Coming up next, raising and consuming events.